Good morning. I would invite everyone to Judges, the 12th chapter. That's where we're going to be at in just a couple seconds. Judges, chapter 12. It is good to be back with you uh, in this area. I assumed going to Colorado would be colder. It wasn't. It was hot there. I thought, well, maybe I'd heard that it was cold here, so I came back here. It's still hot here. I don't know what I have to do to get some cold weather in this world, but I'm kind of tired of it. But it is always great to see you guys, to worship with my spiritual family, to be with people that I love and know so, or know so much and love so much. Um, it's great to be back with you. I heard last week that there were quite a few people out. I know that happens during fall break season with schools. Uh, but it looks like everybody's back, and it looks like we've got a couple visitors as well. So it's always good to have everybody with us. I mentioned a few weeks ago, I think it was the beginning of September, that the beginning of September is my anniversary for having been here. And I think last uh, September was 14 years, which I'm actually surprised that you've put up with me for 14 years. But that's a whole other discussion by itself. But I remember it wasn't that long after I started, and we were quite a bit smaller then. And I got up and did an introduction very similar to this, and I mentioned about how happy I am to be here in Greenville. And as I said that phrase, I went on and I could sense a mood had shifted in the room just a little bit, um, just like it did just a second ago. And as I was finishing the sermon, I was near the back. The back door was a little up at that point, And everybody kind of, and there's like half a dozen people there. And keep in mind, I had just moved to Greenville not too long ago. And everybody was standing there and nobody really looked that amused at that point. And they all kind of sat there and the very first person came up and said, great sermon. I said, thank you so much. I thought I had had some kind of false doctrine that slipped out. And the very first person said, great sermon, but you know that it's Greenville, not Greenville. And I looked and the rest of the line behind them, all of them simultaneously nodded their heads. And that was the very first time that I realized just how emphatic people are about the names they're spelling. Nathan does the same thing with Cooper, by the way. It's spelled Cooper. There's no U's. He spells it Cupper. He is how he pronounces it. Do not make that mistake around people. But I've noticed that we get very territorial about the way that we pronounce things, the area that we're from. And that was kind of my first introduction to that. And I think you see that in Judges, the 12th chapter. This is a little nugget that's met, kind of jammed in there. We didn't really discuss it too much in our Judges core that we did a few, I think maybe six or eight months ago. But it is kind of this interesting little nugget. In Judges, the 12th chapter, this comes right on the heels of Jephthah. If you remember Jephthah, he's the one that makes the rash vow about his daughter. That comes right on the heels of that. Well, Jephthah had asked the Ephraim, the tribe of Ephraim, to come in and help in their battle against the Ammonites. Ephraim refused to for whatever reason. But by the time Judges 11 rolls around and it's over, the Ammonite battle is over, Jephthah and Ephraim are going to have a little beef. And they're not happy about that little misunderstanding that they had. And Jephthah decides to kind of take it out on the Ephraimites. So if you look in Judges chapter 12, starting in verse 1, it says, The men of Ephraim were summoned, and they crossed to Zaphon and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over, or why did you cross over to fight against the sons of Ammon without calling us to go with you? We would have obviously gone down with you. We'll burn your house down on top of you. Jephthah said to them, The people were at great strife with the sons of Ammon, and when I called you, you did not deliver me from their hands. So there's that misunderstanding. I said that I called you. Why did you not call me? We see that same argument in today's world. When I saw that you would not deliver me, I then took my life in my hands and crossed over against the sons of Ammon, and the Lord gave them into my hand. Why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought Ephraim. The men of Gilead defeated Ephraim because they said, You are fugitives of Ephraim, O Gileadites, in the midst of Ephraim and in the midst of Manasseh. The Gileadites then captured the fords of the Jordan opposite Ephraim. And it happened that when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, Let me cross over, the men of Gilead would say to him, Are you an Ephraimite? And if he said, No... Then they would say to him, and listen to this in verse 6, they would say to him, say now, Shibboleth. But if he pronounced it Sibboleth, for he could not pronounce it correctly, then they seized him and slew him at the fords of the Jordan. Thus there they fell at the time 42,000 of Ephraim. The story as it unfolds in Judges chapter 12 is one of strife. And there's going to be a lot of strife in the book of Judges. It's going to culminate at the end of the book of Judges with this massive civil war that takes place amongst all the tribes. But you see the seeds of it kind of percolating here in Judges chapter 12. You have the strife between the men of Jephthah, which is basically everybody else in Israel, and then you have the men of Ephraim. They're at odds with each other. Well, misunderstanding. And so in order to tell who's who, what they decided to do was they said, why don't you pronounce to us the word Shibboleth? Well, the men of Ephraim could not pronounce it because their dialect, they couldn't pronounce it that way. And they pronounced it Sibboleth minus the H. And that's how they knew that there were people that were from the other side trying to be fugitives across the river without answering for their sins, allegedly. And you have there at the end of Judges chapter 1, verse 6, 42,000 souls that are lost because of that little, that little marker that they used. 
And I think we use things like this in today's world all the time. This is not an uncommon thing. If you look back at World War II, you see similar methods trying to use. You had a lot of Germans. Sometimes you had Japanese spies that were trying to make their way into, into uh, U.S. camps and things like that. And so they would ask them. They would ask them to pronounce words. And because of the German and Japanese dialect, they weren't able to pronounce words. My personal favorites is when they started asking German spies to see if they were spies or not, they used to ask them who plays first base for the Yankees. And if they couldn't tell who it was, then they obviously knew that they were a spy because everybody knows who plays first base for the Yankees, as you all do right now. I don't. I don't care either because I'm a Red Sox fan. That's different. But that's how they used to determine those types of things. And I would argue that we still have some of those shibboleths in today's world. We put up these little markers sometimes to determine to ourselves Are you a part of our group or are you not a part of their group? Now, saying that, I want to make one thing plain. Sometimes shibboleths are necessary. Look at 1 John chapter 4. We talked about this a little bit in our Bible class this morning. Look at 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, this is not a, a terribly late book, but it's a later book than some of the other epistles. And so what John is chiefly concerned with, at least in these two epistles, these three epistles, is kind of preserving sound doctrine. There's a lot of distortions of it going around. And so in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that is coming. And now it is already in the world. That's an example of a shibboleth. What you have here is you have Christians that were looking at people that were claiming to be Christians and arguing, are you really a Christian or are you not a Christian? And the litmus test, as John puts forth in verses 2 and 3, is are you confessing that Jesus Christ came in the flesh? Or are you, like some of the Gnostic teachings were, are you claiming that it was just a spirit that came in? Which one are you claiming? Because if you're claiming the latter, if that's what you believe, you are absolutely not a Christian. He says, verse 4, You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak us from the world, and the world listens to them. That's how they know. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. Well, by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. You can use doctrinal things to determine whether somebody is actually a Christian or whether simply they claim to be a Christian. He does the same thing in 2 John. Look over at 2 John if you would. Should just be a couple pages over to the right. 2 John in verse 7. He amps up the intensity a little bit in this section. He says, for many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far does not abide in the teaching of Christ, does not have God. And the one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. This is another example of a shibboleth, albeit a little bit different. You have in verse 7, the other designation that was used in 1 John chapter 4, do you accurately describe the essence of God? Is he flesh or is he spirits? But then in verse 9, he kind of adds another caveat on that. It says anyone that goes too far and does not abide in the doctrine of God. Anyway, in other words, anyone who says too much, they also aren't speaking for God. And that's a danger that we sometimes can have. Sometimes we have a danger as Christians of not saying enough. We don't give God enough credit. Sometimes we go too far and we say that he's all these other things when he's really not. And that's where you have the manifestation of Revelation 22 when he says anyone who claims or anyone who vetoes any bit of this word of God, he himself is a heretic. Galatians 1 says the same thing. If anyone comes down to you and preaches a different gospel other than you have heard, let him be accursed. We have to keep with what the Bible says. And so as we're, as we use shibboleths to accurately measure whether or not somebody is a Christian, there are other occasions, I would argue, when we create shibboleths to use for our own standard of whether or not somebody is a Christian. Look at Matthew, the 15th chapter. Matthew, chapter 15. This is just one of about 347 different examples you could have chosen from the Gospels. And I would argue this is one of those things that Jesus battled a lot with the early Jews, was not whether or not they had faith, but whether or not they had the right kind of faith. Whether that faith was actually vested in God, or is vested in their own source of pride and ego. Matthew chapter 15, starting verse 1, it says, Then some Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? Well, right there you know where the source of this comes from. For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. 
And he answered and said to them, why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? I'll see you a earthly tradition, and I'll raise you a godly commandment. Verse 4, for God said, honor your father and mother. He who speaks evil of father and mother is to be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father and mother, whatever I have that would help you has been given to God. He is not to honor his father or his mother. And by this, ironically, you invalidated the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you that this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. When he uses this passage from Isaiah chapter 6, and this is not the only time that something like this comes up, you see him using this phrase, in vain you worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. That's a direct attack on these earthly shibboleths. These people had created this idea of washing your hands before you eating meat because in their mind, that protected them against all uncleanliness. If you washed your hands, this is a very COVID-relevant thing, if you wash your hands then obviously there's no chance of you being impure, which is a direct commandment from God. And so if you wash your hands, then that also becomes a great suggestion, but it turns into an earthly commandment. And by this point in history, the Jews had looked at that as being right up there alongside God's. And so when Jesus, command, or Jesus followers don't do that, they look at them and say, why are you not measuring yourselves? Why are you not living up to our standard? We created this shibboleth. Why are you not living up to that? And Jesus retaliates by saying those very shibboleths that you have created have tragically and ironically made null the word of God. For you're doing this, this tradition, instead of doing what God actually told you to do. And that's the real tragedy of shibboleths. That sometimes we become gatekeepers. We become kind of reforms. We make up our own litmus test that God never described, never authorized, doesn't want, and are at their, at their root a sense of pride for us. You don't meet my standard. And if you don't meet my standard, then you sure don't meet God's standard. And that's why those types of shibboleths are things that we need to tear down. One of the best examples of this you see is in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Levi mentioned this in passing, and I held my breath because I didn't want him to give all of it away. But the idea of eating of meats in 1 Corinthians 8 is a prime example of this. It's hard for us, I think, in today's world to see just how intense of a situation this was. But you have people in the first century who were adamant, we have the liberty of Christ. You can do whatever you want to do. You can eat meats, you can eat this, you can eat whatever. It doesn't really matter. There were other people, because of conscience sake, could not bear to even eat a piece of meat if it even hinted or sniffed at an idol. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, you have at least a little bit of this beginning here. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, starting in verse 1. He says, now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogance, but love edifies. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known as he ought to know. Or he is known as, he is known by him, rather. What we see in this passage is this disconnect between people who are very prideful themselves and have knowledge, and people that for whatever reason are weaker in the faith. Maybe that they're not an established Christian. Maybe they're new. Maybe they're coming from a distinctly difficult background to come from and to accept all the things that Christianity asks and demands of us. Whatever it is, they're weak in the faith. And so there's this division that's erupted over this idea of eating meats. And some people say, well, you can do it. Some people say you can't. But what we see in this whole passage here is that shibboleths that are man-made and created between brethren are, in fact, sinful. There was nothing that really talked about the idea of eating meats. There wasn't really this discussion. You can look at Acts chapter 15 and see some guidelines along those. But as we talked about in class, a lot of those are situational. Are you going to eat meat around these people? Are you going to not eat meat around these people? What's this situation going to consist of? And when we establish these kind of shibboleths between us because of our own litmus tests, then that's a problem. Because these shibboleths are not established based on anything except pride. Look at how great I am. Look at how strong a Christian I am that I can do this, that I can withhold myself from this, that I've created this boundary for myself. Good for you. But not every Christian is at that point. Look at 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. Go back several chapters. This arrogance of conceit, conceit that some people have, where they think they can just boss people around. Not even the apostles had that attitude even though they could very well boss people around. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting verse 18. This is the approach the apostles took. He said, Let no man deceive himself. If any man thinks among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. In other words, if you think you know everything, then take it down a notch. 
because arrogance is a marker of the fact that you really don't know that much. Verse 19, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness for God. For it is written, he is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. You think you're smart. God's a billion, trillion, infinity times smarter than you, as Lee Logan would say. Verse 20, again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise that they are useless. So then let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all things belong to you and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. The apostles did not erect man-made shibboleths between people. What they did every single time was humbly submit to what God taught on the situation. And when they were presented with these types of situations that were kind of situational or maybe had some differing judgment opinions on them, they yielded to the situation. They always put doctrine first and foremost, but then they made judgment calls into other things. They didn't erect these man-made boundaries and say, you shall absolutely not do this under any circumstances. They largely looked at the situation because what they understood was that these shibboleths oftentimes come from a point of pride, which leads me in my second point, which is that winning the argument doesn't just make you right. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, for instance, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, starting in verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, starting in verse 4. This is the argument as Paul sees it regarding the eating of meats. He says, therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world. We know that. That's, a, that's an understanding that Christians have, that idols are just blocks of wood. We know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. That's the knowledge that we're all trying to get to. As he's mentioned, as he's going to mention this chapter, not everybody's at that point. Because some people who come from this pagan background have this idea that an idol exists somewhat in reality. And if you eat meats that are in, volunteer, or that are in worship to that idol, well, then that's just the same as sacrifice. They can't handle that. They'll get to verses 4 through 6 eventually. But just because I have that knowledge already, verses 1 through 3, just because I have that knowledge already and have beaten you into submission doesn't make me a champion. Because it could very well be that in that process, what I've done is tear down your conscience. And what I've done is tear down your drive for God. Maybe I've tore down your confidence. And so just because I've won the argument against you, that doesn't automatically make me right. Paul goes into this more in chapter 13. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 1. This is the backdrop for the famous love chapter, if you will. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 1. We read this. I want to read it again, and I want to read it again slowly. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 1. He says, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but don't have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, I know all mysteries and all knowledge. If I have all faith so as to remove mountains but I don't have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but I don't have love, it profits me nothing. That is not the position that some people would take. Some people would look at these gifts of miracles, these healings, the sacrifices that they're making, and they say, look at all the things that I'm doing, God. Look at how valuable I am to you. I am by far your MVP in the church. But notice what he elevates either right next to that or arguably right above that. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, read this again. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I don't have love, I've become a noisy gong or a clinging symbol. If I have the gift of prophecy, I know all mysteries, I have all knowledge, and I have all faith, so as to even remove mountains, but I don't have love, I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, if I surrender my body to be burned, but I don't have love, it profits me nothing. If I do the most amazing works on the planet, if I win every single argument with every single atheist, if I win every single point of discussion with my brethren, but I don't do it in love and I don't do it in a sense to build them up rather than to tear me down, that argument is worthless. And what Paul establishes here is that winning the argument by itself isn't what he cares about. The building up of people's souls are. And with that in mind, we have to have the attitude of looking towards other people. Ben from, read from this, I think, earlier. But look at, back at Romans chapter 14. 
Seems like everyone's stealing my notes this morning. I don't know why. But look at what he says in Romans chapter 14. Keep in mind this, what he's talking about here, is not a sense of doctrine. Doctrine needs to be established. That's not what's in view this morning. It's the how and it's the opinions that we're talking about largely. Romans chapter 14, starting at verse 13. He says, Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. He has that knowledge. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 3. He has that knowledge. But to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you're no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. If you underline or highlight, that's a fantastic phrase to do so. Therefore, verse 16, do not let us for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, verse 19, we pursue the things which make for peace and And the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It's hard for us sometimes to look over at other people who have these convictions, who have these conscious issues. And it's hard for those of us who may have knowledge in certain areas to look at that person and say, I cannot believe how weak and how easily manipulated those people are. Those people just need to grow up. And when we say that, we're conveniently overlooking the fact that we may have conscious issues of our own that people are overlooking for us. Just because we won the argument doesn't mean that we're always right. I'll take it a step further and say that shibboleths aren't always due to sin. The eating of meat situation was settled. There wasn't, as Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, there wasn't an issue with the eating of the meats itself. The problem that he's addressing there is the conscience approach to that. If you look at Luke, the ninth chapter, look over that, if you would. If you look at Luke, the ninth chapter, starting in verse 51. Sometimes these man-made shibboleths that we've come up with aren't always because we're safeguarding. They're not always against sin. They're sometimes just against my opinion. In Luke, the ninth chapter, starting in verse 51, it says, When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead of him. And they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangement for him. But they didn't receive him because he was traveling towards Jerusalem. That's wrong. They should have received him. Verse 54, when his disciples James and John saw this, they were irate. They said to him, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. And he said to them, you don't know what kind of spirit you are. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. When we erect these shibboleths that are nothing more than conscience issues, we're doing, the exact op- or we're doing exactly what these people are doing. My opinion is this, you stand on this side, and I'm going to call down thunder on you. And yet think about what Jesus said. My point is not to come around from town to town annihilating cities that don't receive me immediately. Maybe I'll be a little patient with them. Maybe the issue isn't that they're just blatantly in sin, the entire city. Maybe it's just that they're a little misguided. Maybe they need a little bit more teaching. Maybe they need a little bit more help. Maybe they need a little bit more understanding. And if I can have that patience with them, then instead of nuking an entire town or a relationship, I can work with them to get them to the point that they need to be at. Sometimes these shibboleths aren't about the idea of sin at all, as much as they are about my opinion. And here's the final point that I'll leave you with this morning. Whatever souls that we get, whatever person we can convert to Christ, whether that's somebody who is weak or somebody that's not even a Christian, however close we can bring them to Christ, is worth far more than any victory we may have in our relationship with them. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, starting verse 9. He says, Take care that, that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you who has knowledge dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so by sinning against the brother and by wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, verse 13, this is the only conclusion that Paul can come to in this scenario. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I'll never eat meat again, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. This is the scenario that Paul lays out. He says, you have this person in 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 3, that has the knowledge and the understanding that eating meat is not wrong of itself. No, worship to idols. There's no such things as idols. And so he, being emboldened in that faith, goes and eats 
And the little, I always think like this little patio area right out in front of an idol's temple. And he's just blatantly eating idolatrous meat right there in front of everybody. Because after all, he knows for a fact that it's right. I know it, black and white. And then Bill comes along. I always pick on Bill. That's my guy. Bill comes along, who isn't so convinced of that. And Bill walks by and sees Steve. I don't know why I picked that name. Sees Steve eating in the patio area. And Bill thinks to himself, well, maybe I'm wrong about this. And if I'm wrong about this, maybe I'm wrong about that. And maybe if he is such a paragon of righteousness, if I see him doing something that I think is wrong, then maybe none of us are righteous. And maybe this whole thing that I'm engaged in is worthless. Maybe this, this fight that I'm doing against temptation, maybe it's no one voice. Maybe it doesn't mean anything. Then Sunday morning rolls around, accommodatively speaking. Why am I going to waste my time there? Why am I going to study the Bible? Because after all, I don't have any knowledge of what's truth. And what I do know is true. That guy is just blatantly disobeying it. I'm not at that point that he's at yet. And then I'm lost forever. Now I will bear the brunt of that. That's my punishment. The guy who's eating the patio could be responsible for that as well. When we focus more on victories in our life than souls, we become a cult. If the only thing that we're obsessed with is the amount of numbers that we can jam inside the building, rather than the amount of souls we can lead to Christ, whether it's one or a million, it doesn't matter. When we become more obsessed with numbers than we are souls, we become a cult. And may we never get to the point, as Christians, that we're willing to just dominate conversations, to put people in their place for the sake of holding people to my shibboleths. The person that, or the thing that God is most hateful towards is the idea of losing any soul. Look at Psalm 103. Psalm 103. We talked this morning about the long-suffering of God, and we didn't spend as much time on that as I wanted to, but you can't have the mercy of God without the judgment of God. You can't have the judgment of God by the same token without the mercy of God. And so in Psalm 103, starting in verse 6, David writes, the Lord performs, performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. He may known his ways to Moses. He acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us. This is the marriage of judgment and mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And this is the verse that I want to focus on, verse 14. For he himself knows our frame, and he is mindful that we are, both, we are but dust. That's the attitude that God has towards us. If you want to know why he's long-suffering towards us, it's because he knows us better than we will ever know ourselves. And what he knows about us is that we're always not as strong as we think we are. We can't do any of this on our own. And sometimes we're vulnerable to these types of prejudices and these shibboleths that we create. And because he knows that about us, he's willing to be long-suffering to give us time to work through that. Are we willing to know that about each other? Are we willing to recognize about each other that we are but dust? And that when somebody comes up and doesn't, quote, unquote, meet my standard of what a Christian should be, and keep in mind, it is my standard, if that's what I'm talking about, not God's. If they don't meet my standard of what God they're supposed to be, am I long-suffering towards them? The situation with Jephthah in Judges 12 and, and Ephraim is, if you look at it, there's blame on both sides. The Ephraimites refused to come and help Jephthah, regardless of what they said in chapter 12. And Jephthah wasn't patient enough to allow them time to come. So there was error on both sides. But the problem with that was that they never once sat around and said, hey, let's actually talk this out. Instead, what they did was they came up with this shibboleth idea to identify who they thought were traitors. And because of that, they were willing to kill 42,000 people for the sake of their perceived slight. Oftentimes, these things that we're willing to toe the line on aren't God's standards, but they're ours. And they can come at an extreme cost to people's souls. And that's why I tell us this morning to tear down the shibboleths that are in your life. If you have man-made designations about what a Christian should be that's not in any way rooted in Scripture, tear those down. Be long-suffering towards each other. Be hospitable to one another. Be patient with one another. Overlook things that that aren't found in Scripture, that are just purely opinion. Hold fast to doctrine. 
but be long-suffering towards each other. If we can help you make that walk towards Christ, we ask that